Hallelujah. Avoid unbelief and hardness of heart. Consider the promise. We're going to pick that up where we were a couple weeks ago. The reason I believe this is so important is sometimes we don't realize and we think we're believing and we're not. We think we know something and we might have head knowledge of it. The assignment that's on this church is that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Freedom from every situation out there in the world system. Spirit, soul, and body. And 3 John 2 says, I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So any area of our life that we don't have prosperity healing, whatever it is. It's a soul realm problem. It's not a God problem. It's a soul realm. It's a mind, will, and emotions problem. And unbelief and hardness of heart is a soul realm problem. And we will never be able to walk in the freedom that Jesus purchased for us unless our mind is renewed so that we will know what is the hope of our calling, so that we will know God's perfect plan and purpose for our lives to walk in this day. There's, the world is getting crazier and crazier. It's just the way it is. Unfortunately, it's getting crazier. There's more stuff out there than we could imagine. You know, we used to hear of things, but, I mean, it's like... When did you think? I never thought in my imagination at any time they would start cutting heads off of Christians. Line them up. What the believer needs to be able to walk in this time is revelation knowledge, a soul realm renewed to the fact that we have dominion and authority. And zero fear. And that's the purpose. And we really sometimes don't realize when we have unbelief or hardness of heart. And that will stop our authority. So we've looked at, Jesus said, do my works and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. But if we have unbelief or a hardened heart, one big problem that will come from that is we won't be able to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd telling us what to do. We look at other situations, we look at people, and, and they say, how can there be a God? And we're judging God by what other people do or don't do. We have a book here that tells us exactly what our Heavenly Father is. And David read it this morning, for God so loved, he gave. Love is the adjective of God. It's a description of God. The action to love is give. The action for love is give. If you say you love God and there's no giving, you don't. You might have an emotion, but when you love God and you give him your life, your finances, your abilities, your talents... With zero fear, that's love. But you never outlove God or outgive Him. So we had looked at detail at Abraham because Abraham is the father of the faith. We are the seed of Abraham. And we saw that Abraham considered not his own body, so what did he consider? The promise. The same thing we're to consider. He staggered not through unbelief or disbelief. If you're in unbelief, you will stagger at the promises of God. If there's unbelief or hardness of heart, you will not believe the promises of God. You will stagger at them. And so if, if uh, we have, we hear that we can be healed, 
we can be delivered, we can prosper. And we think, well, God, show me. You're, you've got a hardened heart. You're staggering at the promise of God. We found out that unbelief is unfaithfulness, faithless, weakness of faith, and disbelief. Now, hardness of heart, I used to always think if somebody was, you hear about hardened criminals and people that are a hard heart and they can just, you know, like these people that are beheading people, you think they're hardened. Well, they are. But that started with a hardened heart. And it's what you consider that causes your heart to be hard. It says hardness of heart to cover with a thick skin, to harden with a callus, to make the heart dull, lose the power of understanding. When we do not have understanding of the word of God, we will have a hardened heart. It doesn't mean we're reprobate. Sometimes we think somebody with a hardened heart is a reprobate. That's not what it is. You're hardened or callous. You put this unbelief in. You're looking more, uh, another one is relating more easily to the natural realm than to the supernatural. You're looking at the circumstances and you're relating to that and you're considering that and you're seeing that more than you are seeing the word of God and that causes you to have a hardened heart. We should reach the place where we're, we are moved more by what God says than anything else. By what God says. Not by what my father, my mother, my uncle, my aunt, my church says. Not by what the government says. We're to obey the laws of the land. But if they're telling us to denounce Jesus, we are to be more sensitive to what? Thus saith the Lord. The doctors give us an evil report. I'm not saying you shouldn't deal with it. But you should be more pliable, more open to the word of God than you are to the doctor's report. If you're more open and receive the doctor's report over and above the word of God, you've got a hardened heart. And we looked at examples of that and we, Abraham didn't stagger through unbelief because he considered the promise, and that's to perceive, remark, observe, understand. Attentively fix one eyes or mind upon. So we had looked at examples of that. Jesus fed the people. And then the next time around, they go, where are we going to get the bread? They had the answer right there. They were in a boat, saw Jesus walking. They were filled with fear. And Jesus says, what's wrong with you? So Jesus had shown them what they, he could do. The source was right there. Our source is Jesus. And they still didn't know what to do. So I want to pick it up this morning at Mark chapter... Um, well, before we go to Mark chapter 8, let's go to Proverbs Hardness of heart, as you're going to Proverbs chapter 4, hardness of heart does not mean that you do not know what is true in your head. But it does mean that knowledge is not productive. You can quote all the healing scriptures you want, and they can come right out of your head, but if you have not received revelation knowledge, if you do not have that vision... It's not going to help you. It's a start. So we're not saying you might not know the truth, but you don't perceive it. Did the disciples know the truth that Jesus multiplied the bread and fishes? They did. Did it do them any good? No. Because the next time he said to feed them, they go, yikes. What are we going to, how are we going to do that? It isn't knowing more. We think, well, I didn't get it. Maybe I just better study more, get to know more. Because in the natural realm, you're in grade one, and you have to get to know more to get to grade two, right? 
And in order to get to grade three, you have to get to know more. But you can memorize math principles all you want, but if you don't have a working knowledge of a math principle, somewhere down the road, you're going to get tripped up. You have to have some perception of it, some understanding. That's true with the English language. Oh, dear Jesus, that language. I mean, you need real understanding in order to deal with that language. So no, but spiritually with God's word, just knowing more isn't the answer. Because how many people know and can quote, if you say, by the stripes of Jesus you're healed according to 1 Peter 2.24, they go, I know. But you're sick. I know. But it says, by the stripes of Jesus you were healed, past tense. I know. They can quote all the scriptures, but it's not doing them any good. Jesus said you will know, perceive, understand, have a working knowledge of the truth, and then you'll be free. Because, you know, people that just get born again have miracles. And they don't have a lot of knowledge. You take T.L. Osborne, who was one of the first that had these huge outdoor meetings. And he would be preaching, and people would be jumping up healed. They're not even born again. Healed. Just jumping up healed. Wheelchairs gone. Crutches gone. They had almost zero knowledge. But they're getting healed. Why? Yet we've been in the Word and we've been studying and studying and studying, gaining knowledge, gaining knowledge, and we're not healed. There was a man in India, I don't know how many years, you know, many years ago. And he would preach in India. People just getting healed all over the place. Thousands, tens of thousands of people. I'll have to look back up and find his name. But anyway, so this was happening, and so he ended up being quite perturbed because the people were just coming like they did to Jesus for the loaves and fishes. And so he was getting kind of tired of that because he could never preach the word because everybody's just getting healed, just getting healed. Like, you know, the people were getting healed. They didn't just interrupt Dr. Osborne's teaching, and he had to get them born again. Just getting healed. How come? They had no knowledge. And so this man in India came, and he says, I'm going to go to North America. And I'm going to hold the crusades there and get the people healed there. He got off the boat, I believe, in New York. He walked along, tried to talk to some people, saw the people. He turned around, got back on his ship, and he says, I'm going home. He says, these people are too preoccupied and too busy. Too preoccupied and too busy. So it's not just knowing more. Smith Wigglesworth, the same thing. You look at John G. Lake. So even T.L. Osborne, you know, when he was in, would hold a meeting in America, didn't have the same success. Why? Why is it? We know more. We know more. But we're seeing less. And I believe because the end days are here, we're going to be seeing more, but we're going to get some understanding. We're going to be made free. Freedom. Hallelujah. We are a society, wherever the society is so geared on knowledge, We bypass the spiritual implications. Because we're so geared to learning, and learning's good, please, don't misunderstand me. We don't want a bunch of ignorant people running around. The body of Christ has got to have the best trained people on the planet. But we don't train our mind at the expense of getting revelation knowledge of God. 
of knowing the truth of the word of God, having a working knowledge. In Ephesians, that means a working knowledge, how to work the word, how to work faith, how to apply it. All it takes in some of these countries, in having read and hearing with, with Dr. Osborne, it takes, you tell him, Jesus healed, and that he shed his blood for you, and they so understand blood covenant. And to know that a man would die for them, and that they can be healed, they receive it. No unbelief and no hardness of heart. They haven't been around long enough to have hardness of heart and unbelief. You see, the word of God will go right to their heart. They don't put it through a filter. When you hear somebody say, uh, we're going to pray for people, and we're gonna, they're going to be healed, whether it's you or somebody else, next thing you know, you put it through a, your filter of experience. Now, I know uncle so-and-so, and I know brother so-and-so, and my church this and that. Well, we'll just see what God's going to do. And you will just see nothing. God in his great mercy has superseded that so often because somewhere in this whole mess there was somebody with faith. Somebody that believed and that was enough to get the other person healed. But it's not nearly to the degree and a magnitude that God wants it to be. Jesus paid the price. He shed his blood. He took the stripe. And that's for his whole body, all believers. He's not there doling it out to some and not the other. Proverbs, are you there yet? Well, maybe you are, but I'm not. I'm going there. Proverbs 4. Glory to God. Thing is, it takes a bit of work. Because we have to change the way we think. And we don't like that because too often the way we think, we think is right. Well, it's just the way I think. Uh, the other day, I, Dave, I said something to David, I, and he said something to me, and I said, that's not scriptural. And he goes, yeah, we're one. Oh, I know, I had something, some item of food. And I said, I'm not, it's mine. I'm not going to share it with you. He says, you have to. I says, well, show me a scripture where I have to. He says, well, we're one. I said, well, glory to God. If we're one, that means when I eat it, you get it too, so I don't have to give you any. <laughs> and he says, well, I don't have a scripture. I just want some. I said, well, fine, take some. <laughs> but you see how you can use the word of God to make, meet any criteria you want? If you want something bad enough, you can take it out of context. You can find an excuse for your silliness. Uh, that, that wasn't meant that way, but hey, if it fits, just wear it. <laughs> Glory to God. And then we know somebody who we thought was real spiritual... And they died. So, of course, if God didn't heal them, why would he heal me or you or anybody else? You have no idea what they're like. You have no idea the condition of their heart. You can walk around. I can come up here. Well, it's kind of hard up here because I'm teaching it, so it's got to be in me. Or after a while, you'd all be gone because it would be so dry, it'd just burn up. But you, somebody can come in here, glory to God, yes, I know, hallelujah, and all the words are right. But when you're out there where the rubber meets the road, when a bit of pressure's on, what's coming out of you? That'll tell you 
what's in your heart. That'll tell you if you've got unbelief and a hard heart. So what do we do? We, 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 why does this happen? Well, Proverbs 4, 20. It says, my son. So he's talking to sons, which means he's talking to us because we are sons of God. Amen? Amen. So he's talking to us. This is to the sons. Attend to my words. Now, attend means to put them first place. How are you paying attention to the word of God? How are you paying attention to it? When you pay attention to something, you know, like if, if, if um, your child comes home or, or something and, and whatever you're doing and they come and they ask you a question, you go, yeah, that's nice. You heard it. But did you pay attention? Did you give value to it? What are you giving value to? It says, pay attention to my words. How much value are you placing on the word of God? How much expectation is on it? Attention. Pay attention. My son, give attention to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Well, that's too. You incline your ear when you're speaking the word of God out loud. You're hearing it, so you're inclining your ear. But it also is a case of if you will pay attention to the word, then with your spiritual ears, listen, you will hear what God's saying to you and you will get revelation. Without doing that, you won't. You might have some knowledge. You might know some facts. It says in Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're not going there right now, but it says that the natural man cannot perceive, understand, or know the word of God because it is spiritually discerned. And if all you have is in your head and you haven't got revelation knowledge which only comes by the Holy Spirit attending to the word, inclining your ear, you won't have it and it's inoperative. Now, it's a big way, I mean, having your mind renewed. But if all you're doing it is so you can say, glory, hallelujah, shama, shama, it's not doing you any good. Verse 21, let them not depart from your eyes. So I know if when I'm driving, I can speak 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bore my sins in his body on the tree that I'm dead to sin and I'm alive unto righteousness. You can't separate being delivered from sin, alive to righteousness and being healed because right then after you've got that, it says by his stripes I'm healed. I can quote, I, I, I'll quote that as I'm going about my business. But it says, let them not depart from your eyes. I have got to turn to that scripture and put my eyes on it. I have to see those words with my eyes. And then it says, keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Now, how do you keep them in the midst of your heart? By what you're attending to, and whatever you attend to, if you're attending to God's word, you're inclining your ear to his saying, you're keeping them, your eyes on them, you will get them in the midst of your heart and they will stay there. And then you will have health to all your flesh. There's no shortcut. We want a shortcut. And yes, the anointing's here, and there's the corporate anointing. But a lot of people get healed under a corporate anointing, and they walk out, and because they have not gotten and don't care for their heart, oh, glory to God, I'm healed. Pastor Dave prayed for me, and now I'm healed, and I don't have a sore back or whatever the case was. And so you go off listening to the same trash you've always listened to, and then two weeks later, you wonder why you've got the same pain or worse back 
And then you go, I guess God didn't heal me after all. I guess it's just all a farce. It's just no point there. You didn't keep your heart. You allowed unbelief and hardness of heart to come in. Now remember, again, the meaning of hardness of heart is relating more easily to the natural realm than to the spiritual. In the supernatural, you can be sensitive to what you want. And you can be hardened by what you want to. So if anybody says, you know, I just can't, I just do that. I just do this sin. It's just part of me. You're hardened to the answer to that. But your heart can become hardened to the sin. You harden your heart to whatever you want to harden it to. It's your choice. And I'm going to show you from some scripture where all of this is our choice. Glory to God. And now I'm going to look at Mark 8 today. We'll look there and we'll probably end there. Maybe. I don't want to say for sure because that's not good. Mind you, my children aren't here, so they probably wouldn't call me on it. They would if they were here, for sure. Mark 8, verse 18. Now Jesus had compassion, the, um, did the fishes. Now he said, beware of the leaven. Now they're concerned about bread again. Just after he saw the, they saw how he multiplied the bread and the fishes, he says, be concerned about the leaven and go, instead of going, oh, yeah, what does he mean by leaven? They should have known that that meant sin. Because in the Jewish culture, when they were going to have Passover, they knew they had to clean the house of all leaven. They went through it thoroughly because leaven was like sin. It was a parallel to sin. They should have known that. But here they are thinking about their belly. Uh-oh, he's saying that because we forgot bread and he had just fed thousands. And now they're concerned about bread. Instead of saying, well, he can't be talking about food because he just multiplied all this. Jesus is in our midst. We've seen him do these miracles. There's no limit to what he can do. But they didn't. They didn't even remember what leaven was parallel to. And so now they're concerned about their belly. And Jesus said in verse, actually I said 18, but let's go to 17. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because you have no bread? Perceive you not yet, neither understand. Have you your heart yet hardened? The New Living Translation says, I don't have that one, that particular verse. That's number 17, New Living. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Is your heart, is my heart too hard to take in the fact that by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed? That I am in Christ? That I am the righteousness of God in Christ? And it's my right to be walking in divine health. Verse 18. Having eyes, you see not. Didn't we just look in Proverbs about where we're to keep our eyes? Having eyes, you see not. And having ears, hear ye not. And do you not remember? New Living Translation says, You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Notice whose problem this is. It wasn't Jesus' problem. It was their problem. Don't you remember anything at all? And people say, well, I just can't remember. 
You're really good at remembering scriptures. You're good at remembering that. What are you paying attention to? Everybody remembers things. What are you paying attention to? What's top priority? People say they can't remember things. And a song comes on from X number of years ago and they're just hopping along with it, singing the words. And we say, well, I can't remember that. You're just blessed. We all have the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God dwells richly within us. What are you paying attention to? What are you giving top priority in your life? And that's what you'll get a result from. We saw Mark 4. 30, 60, 100 fold. On the amount of attention you give to the word, that's what you will receive. The sower sows the word. That's the parable. We know when we were in school, we memorized the times table. Well, they, I don't even know if they memorized times tables anymore, but we did. We had to memorize the times tables. Had to memorize spelling. Everybody could memorize. The only ones that couldn't were the ones that said they couldn't, and we preferred to throw spitballs. As we all know, that's probably the boys. <laughs> girls don't do those things, right, girls? If you did, just look straight ahead and we won't know it's you. <laughs> we all can memorize. We can all remember. And Jesus said, don't you remember anything at all? He called them up on it because they should have remembered. And he's saying the same thing to us. What's priority in your life? I mean, people, you talk to people that like sports, they can give you all the stats of some player. They can give you the stats of who won what. When the Eskimos won, when they didn't win. When the Oilers won, when they didn't. How many goals this one scored and how many goals that one scored? And that this one didn't score any. Oh, they can memorize and they can remember. You can remember what you have to do at work when, when you think, if you're told, if you don't start doing it right, you're out. And if you're a person that does not want to go on welfare, you will make sure you remember how to do it. God's given us a brain and a mind that can work. But you know what? Your brain is the hard drive. And whatever you attend to will be, is the software, and what you attend to will be programmed into the hard drive. And that's what will come out of you. And what it, that is is whatever is priority in our life. So Jesus says... Don't you remember anything at all? I'm still reading New Living. What about the 5,000 men I fed with five loaves of bread? How many baskets of leftover did you pick up afterward? Twelve, they said, verse 20. And when I fed 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. He says, don't you understand yet? Whose responsibility was it to get to the place of understanding? It's theirs. We like to blame, blame Jesus. Well, I guess God just doesn't want to heal me today. He doesn't want to prosper me. It's a case of understanding. In verse 21, King James, how is it that you do not understand. In his own hometown, he marveled at their unbelief. He marveled. He also marveled at the centurion's faith. How great faith! And he marveled at their unbelief. That's unbelief and it causes hardness of heart because we're more attuned to the natural than the supernatural. When we go by our physical sight, our five senses, the Bible says we're carnal, we're natural people. And so when something then happens in this natural, physical realm, it gets us all in a flap, and we think it's a higher order of things than what God has to say. 
That's a hardened heart. That's a hardened heart. As I said, I'm using this definition. I'm not saying you're reprobate. But you have covered over and your soul realm is attuned to the natural realm and the things of the natural happenings than it is to the word of God. What your heart is sensitive to, you will remember. So we have to, it says, how do we guard our heart? Eyes, ears, mouth. Eyes, ears, mouth. Eyes, ears, mouth. Proverbs chapter 4. It's in your eyes, it's in your ears, and it comes out of your mouth, and it'll guard your heart. And then your heart is sensitive to it. We decide what our heart's going to be sensitive to, and we decide what we're going to remember. What your heart is hardened to, you will forget. And everybody goes, oh, my heart's not hardened towards God. No, not towards God. But they had Jesus in their midst. He had been performing these miracles. He mentions something, they go, oh, we don't have bread. Instead of, when something happens to us, we should go, glory to God. The creator of the universe is my father. Jesus bore all my sicknesses and diseases in his body on the tree. Hallelujah. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, and I am in him, and I am righteous, and a righteous person does not have anything unrighteous, and sickness and disease and poverty and lack is unrighteous. And you just, that's what you're, because you've had your heart softened to that. If you don't do that and you say, oh, I, I, you know, I don't know why I got sick. I thought I was supposed to be healed. Now look at this. And somebody can say, well, yeah, didn't, didn't, didn't Jesus heal you of this? Or didn't you see him do this miracle? Yeah, I know, but you know what? I wonder when he's going to come down and lay his hands on my little head. And I'll all be fine. And Romans says, don't say that. Don't even think it. You have to make up your mind. You have to make an absolute decision. What am I going to attend to? What is going to be priority? And what am I going to believe? And nobody can do it for you. But you have to make that decision. It's a decision only you can make. We can act holy, we can do all these things, but we have got to make what's number one priority in our life. And it's easy to make. Do I want to walk in victory? Zero fear, zero sickness, zero lack. Do I want to fulfill the purpose God has for my life? If I say yes to that, I simply make a decision. What's priority? The word. Jesus. If these other things are more important to me, they will pull my attention and I will put all my energy on that. And all I'm going to get out of it is how much I can personally put into it. Because it's all me. I'm just focusing on me. What can I do? What can I do? Well, I better memorize this and I better do this and better get a second job and a third job. And I'm not criticizing second and third jobs if, if God tells you to get one. If he doesn't, you better not. Hardness of heart. Now we found out hardness of heart relating more easily to the natural realm than to the supernatural produces spiritual retardation. Stunted spiritual growth. And then when, when we're walking in that, 
we will be tossed about with every wind of doctrine. We will always be searching, hunting, looking. Looking to people to meet our needs. Looking to people for the answer. Going from one catastrophe to another. Fear, you hear report that that, that ISIS are on the streets on Jasper Avenue while they were in West Edmonton Mall and fear rises up and God says, I want you to go to West Edmonton Mall because you've been looking for this special little doodad and you have to go to such and such a store to get it. You've been believing me for it. Now I'm telling you, go there and get it. And you go, oh, you kidding me, right? That can't be God. Satan, I rebuke you. I know yes, this is planning on doing something there and you immediately are moved and it's not Isis, it's Isis, but whatever. You are immediately moved in the natural. It causes fear and spiritual retardation. You won't do what God tells you to do because your heart's hardened because of unbelief. Which is why they had a problem to get into that boat. It said Jesus had to constrain them, had to almost force them to get into that boat. They were fishermen. They probably saw signs of an impending storm. Otherwise, if they didn't, they would have just hopped on in and said, sure, fine. But he constrained them to get in. We have authority and we have to realize that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus we have to realize that Jesus paid the price we don't have to pay the price do I hear any amens Amen. the price has been paid and sometimes humanity doesn't like that they think they should work for it you do not have to work for your healing. You do not have to work for your prosperity. I'm talking about working. You have to go out to your work. Why? Because that's where your assignment is. To bring the blessing out there. But the price has been paid. Jesus bore the curse. And everything that comes with the curse, Jesus bore at Calvary and in the pit of hell. And we have to find out who we are and what we are. We are righteous, right standing before God, and we are children of the Most High God. Now, would you let one of your children, anybody that has a child, if you don't have a child, maybe a niece, somebody, would you let that little baby, would you put it and just let it be in a pen with a bunch of snakes? You would do everything to protect that child. Why do you think you're so much better than God? Why? Because we think, well, God didn't hear me. Well, we found out if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And yet we think God will leave us in that pit. But we wouldn't leave our own kids in there. Oh, but God must have a higher reason. You kidding me? You are kidding me. All of his promises are yea and amen in Jesus. But when we think that way, we've got a hardened heart and we're looking at the natural instead of the supernatural. Hallelujah. Please stand.